If there ever were a car that General Motors produced in the 1980s that created a punching bag image for the company, it would be the Cadillac Cimarron. Introduced in 1982 as a sibling to the Chevrolet Cavalier, the Pontiac J2000, the Olds Forenza, and the Buick Skyhawk, the Cadillac Cimarron was perhaps one of the most concrete examples of GM badge engineering at its finest, or not finest, depending on how you look at it. The car retailed for around $12,000 when it came out in 1982, which was roughly double the price of the standard Chevrolet Cavalier. And for that, there really wasn't much different between the Cavalier and the Cimarron. In truth, the Cimarron got a new grille, new wheels, and some taillights. And that was about it for the 1982 inaugural model year. Now, one might say that that was a foolish decision on General Motors' part and that the hubris of the company got the best of itself and they thought they could pawn that $12,000 Cadillac off as a Chevrolet. The truth really was that General Motors never intended the Cimarron to be a J car. It was based on the Cavalier platform. In fact, the car had originally been intended to be introduced as an X-body car, the same car as the Chevrolet Citation, Pontiac Phoenix, Olds Omega, and Buick Skylark, which was a bit bigger than the J car. Unfortunately, however, the X car sales in the 1980 model year and the planned sales for future years were so strong that General Motors was really left with no choice but to introduce the Cimarron on a suboptimal J car platform. And another part that's really not often told for this story is that GM and Cadillac leadership never wanted to introduce the Cimarron so quickly. It really was not anyone's desire to sell a vehicle where the only material differences between the Chevrolet and the Cadillac were the aforementioned grille, wheels, and taillights, as well as some interior trim pieces. But the truth of the matter was that by this point, General Motors dealers, particularly on the West Coast, were clamoring for a small vehicle that they could sell to compete with some of the smaller imports from Audi, Mercedes, and BMW. And there simply was no offering that Cadillac could put together. The dealers were, in fact, so noisy about wanting a small vehicle that GM Brass really had no other choice than to introduce the suboptimal Cimarron and hope that it could at least stem some of the noisiest dealers on the dealer council until it could start refining the offering and making it more palatable to the buying public. This is eventually what happened to the Cimarron is each year, Something new changed on the car, and eventually, by the time the vehicle ended production in 1988, it was actually the best-driving Cadillac in Cadillac's entire lineup, at least if you wanted a sportier vehicle. By that point, it had a multi-port 2.8-liter fuel-injected V6. It had some of its own unique sheet metal, including hood and front fascia, and it also had distinctive rib styling that Pontiac would pick up on as well, both inspired by earlier Mercedes vehicles with that lower body side ribbing. And while it's still a favorite punching bag of automotive journalists all these years later, 40 plus years later, the truth of the matter was is the car really wasn't that bad of a vehicle, nor was it all that great. Certainly the 1982 model year Cimarron suffered from a number of woes, including a Part spin 1.8 liter overhead valve engine that came under hood, which was so bad that General Motors upgraded it to a 2 liter engine across the J car lineup for the 1983 model year, and in some cases also brought in a 2 liter overhead cam four cylinder for use in the J cars, although not in the Cimarron, because everyone universally hated the 1.8 liter engine that was under hood for the 1982 model year. But particularly by the 1985 model year, the Cimarron started getting its unique sheet metal, including the signature Cadillac Power Dome hood, a new front fascia, and a V6, and it became a pretty decent vehicle. And that leads me to this story of a particular Cadillac Cimarron that I'd like to talk with you about for a moment. Now, viewers of this channel will know that I have a soft spot in my heart for this little Cadillac J car, as do a number of automotive collectors, frankly, now, as shocking as that may seem. And truth be told, the Cimarron really wasn't a horrible seller, despite how often it gets criticized. The car sold 132,000 units between the 1982 and 1988 model years, which was roughly equivalent to what 
Oldsmobile sold in terms of Forenzas at about 156000 and it was admittedly a bit less than what Buick sold in terms of its Skyhawk at 178,000 units, but the Cimarron was a more expensive vehicle at a higher price, and really 132,000 units, frankly, isn't that bad for the vehicle overall. Regardless, I've been looking for one of these Cimarrons on the side for some time. I thought it would just be a cool car to have because every automotive journalist out there criticizes it. I'm sure that my viewers would really enjoy a take on a Cimarron from an ownership perspective as opposed to just the typical journalist perspective. And so I was trolling Facebook Marketplace, as I like to every once in a while, and I located a Cadillac Cimarron for sale, a 1986 version, on Facebook Marketplace. And the ad said it only had 9,500 miles, needed some minor work. And I thought, huh, boy, that does look like a low-mileage car. After all, these J cars with 100,000-plus miles, they just look very, very tired. You can tell if the car has over 100,000 miles on it. And this one, it also had the credit option Morgan Cloth interior. These came standard with a leather interior, but you could get this particular so-called Morgan Cloth interior for a reduction in the overall price. And I thought, boy, that's pretty interesting. I always prefer cloth instead of leather anyway. Leather just gets sticky and cold and hot in various weather conditions. And I noticed the car had a couple also other features that I really like. Clearly the V6, which is a must-have if you're going to get a Cimarron, at least from my perspective, has the analog gauges, so you don't have to worry about the digital gauge cluster going out and having to rebuild it, which is pretty typical now that these cars are 40-plus years old. And it had super low mileage at 9,000 miles and was a nice color, this light blue, as you can see here. Appeared to be an overall nice shape. So I contacted the seller. The car had been posted for about 12 hours, and he had already had, he told me, about 10 calls since posting it, but I was the first person that he actually had talked to. So I struck a deal very quickly, and the car is on its way to me. I think it'll be a fun little piece of automotive history to restore. It needs some things. It needs a headliner. I'm sure it needs some mechanical work from sitting, needs some new tires, and I would guess that I'll find some other things, like the air conditioning isn't working. It may take a recharge. It may not. We'll have to find out. But that's part of the adventure, and I thought that I would at least procure it for no other reason than to bring joy to my viewers who know that I have a penchant for 1980s era General Motors vehicles. They are highly imperfect vehicles in a number of ways. But there's just something about driving an 80s era General Motors vehicle, particularly on a fall or a spring day. They tend to just evoke childhood memories for me, and I hope that they do for you as well. So stay tuned as this Cimarron makes its way to me in the Midwest, and we'll do a full review, and we can compare it to other Cadillacs in the stable as well, see how it stacks up. Stay tuned for more, and until that time, be sure to check out my interview with John Manoogian, who is Cadillac's assistant chief designer on the Cimarron, whose team actually put the vehicle together. Now, before you criticize John and the team, bear in mind that nobody in the Cadillac design team wanted to do this car or thought that it would be a success. John's task was pretty simple. He got a grill, wheels, and taillights, and that's all that he could change to try to turn the exterior of the the Cavalier into a Cimarron. So don't fault him for that. I'll just say that in advance before you watch the interview, but check out the link here below until you see the car in the flesh.